gentlemen, gap theory is one of the most controversial topics in the church today. Some believe it, some don't. But the question is, was there a history? Was there a world before the creation of Adam and Eve? Well, you are going to find out that and much more tonight on Thursday Night Theology. Welcome. God bless you. Greetings wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to Thursday Night Theology. I am, of course, am your host, Ryan Peterson, author of Judgment of the Nephilim, the comprehensive biblical study of the Nephilim giants, the fallen angels in the days of Noah, Genesis 6. When we learn about Noah's Ark, why do we have a flood? Why did God send a judgment that wiped out the entire population except for eight people? And of course, animals are made after their kind. Hint, hint. Um, not for the reasons you may, you may think, if you're not familiar with the supernatural account, the war of the bloodlines to prevent the birth of the Messiah, all that is in Judgment of the Nephilim and more. Also the author of The Final Nephilim, the sequel to Judgment of the Nephilim that goes from Genesis to Revelation, exploring the end times. We'll get on to that later. Right now, we're going to focus on tonight's topics for Thursday Night Theology. If you're not familiar... What I basically do is take three or four questions from my followers, my subscribers during the week that are posted on social media, and I try to work for you to apply my research and study and search the scriptures for the best answers that I can produce, that we can learn together, grow in our knowledge of the Bible, and have fun and fellowship. So excited. So really excited. At watch. Uh, you know, put some hearts and thumbs in the room, some thumbs up, some likes and some hearts in the room. Let people know where you're from. This is a night of fellowship to have fun, to learn from the Bible. So that's what it's all about. As always, there will also be a giveaway for a live attendee. You will receive a autographed copy of the final Nephilim. So wherever you are in the world, ship to you, you will receive it. If you're watching on replay, welcome as well. If you have questions for future episodes, you can put them in the comment section of these videos. I always check them to find questions for future episodes. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into question one and look at this idea of the gap theory and what is it? So just to start to give background for those who are not familiar with what is commonly known as the gap theory or the ruin reconstruct reconstruction theory is this concept that in between in Genesis chapter one, between verses one and two, there is an interval of time, an unspecified amount of time that a history takes place before we get to what we know, commonly known as the creation week. And basically in this time, there's a history uh, of life on earth before the creation of Adam and Eve. So um, it's been around for a long time. Um, it became, it re kind of got re-emerged and uh, re-emphasized in the church in the early 19th century um, at some books by a man named Thomas Chalmers who wrote in about the 1830s on the topic what he called the ruined reconstruction uh, theory. And that kind of brought it back in vogue. And so the question is, is that possible? Is there a real history? Do we, could the earth be much older than churches commonly teach, right? Many um, churches, seminaries, professors, and uh, theologians adhere to what's called the YEC, Young Earth Creation Model, that the earth is essentially 6,000 years old. So what is my answer on that, on the gap theory? Do I subscribe to the gap theory? I, the answer is yes. And I think there are some very clear biblical reasons for why we can establish clearly that there is a there is an intervening history in the book of Genesis that we're given um, insights into and we're given previews and peeks into and glimpses into all throughout scripture. And so we're going to go, first of all, right to Genesis chapter one to establish this. So, of course, here is obviously the verses in question. This is the opening of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. You notice I put the Hebrew there, tohu vabohu. We're going to get to that very soon. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And so that's, uh, of course, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And in, in this passage, what we see here is several things. First, we see that the earth, we find it in Genesis uh, verse 1, verse 2, that it says it was without form and void. So this word, tohu bohu in scripture refers to, this is where the idea of a ruin, when Chalmers called the ruin reconstruction, that the earth was in a ruined state. And again, that darkness was upon the face of the deep. And we also see so we have darkness upon the face of the deep. We have the earth in a ruined state. And we have the spirit of God moving upon the water. So the earth is in this damaged state covered with water and enveloped in darkness. And so what the gap theory proposes is that there, the, the earth was ruined in that state as a result of a judgment. And so how can we know that possibly took place? So I want to start with the, I think is the clearest evidence that there was a history before Adam. And that's looking at the fallen angelic realm, specifically the rebellion of Satan. And I think when we start looking at the create the, the angelic realm, we can look at some passages that make it abundantly clear that this was the case. And so that's what we'll look at right now. And so this is in the book of Job, in Job chapter 38. And of course, this is the, the famous passage where God is speaking to Job. He's responding to Job after so many chapters and so much suffering to explain his how vast and how magnificent, how powerful God is. And he's speaking to creation. The Lord speaking to creation and says, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, Benach Elohim, shouted for joy. So we see here that God is clearly talking about the creation of the earth. And at the creation of the earth, when the foundations of the planet were being laid, the angels witnessed it. It says the morning stars sang. This was a celebration in the heavenly realm. And all the sons of God, we know this. If you follow any of my studies or read any of my books, I talk extensively about the sons of God because they are the sinning. They, they were the rebel angels in Genesis chapter six who fathered the Nephilim. It says they shouted for joy. So again, we're seeing here clearly the Bible establishes that angels existed at the creation of the earth. So that to me alone establishes that there is a history that precedes the creation of Adam because they witnessed the creation of the earth. So they witnessed, they obviously were existing and celebrating and interacting and reacting to God's power and creation well before Adam was created. So that I think is one clear piece of biblical evidence that we, you know, and that's fine. The Bible establishes that. Going even further, specifically to earth itself, and we look at, you know, in Ezekiel chapter 28, we see the evidence of angels on earth before Adam's creation. And I think in Ezekiel 28 is what I call an esoteric passage. And this is one of a passage where God is addressing a king or a ruler in the passage, in the introduction, but is truly directing the message to a fallen angel. The most famous example of this is in Isaiah chapter 14, where it lists the aspirations of Lucifer, of the Antichrist, of the devil, and says, how, the, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? And says that it lists his aspirations, that he shall be like the Most High, sit upon the mount of the congregation, basically ruling over heaven and earth. But that passage is addressed to the king of Babylon. Yet the things that are said clearly could not apply to a normal mortal king. Falling from heaven, uh, ruling over angels, it's an address to an angelic being. A similar esoteric passage is found in Ezekiel chapter 28, which is really addressing Satan and going back to when he was still righteous, serving God. And look at what we find there. So let's go right to that passage now. So this is Ezekiel 
chapter 28 and verse 15. God says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covenant. So, here again, God is identifying that, that Satan was in the garden of God. And in fact, he lists those precious stones. He goes into the list of covenant, the topaz, and lists nine different jewels that it said Satan wore. And the interesting thing about that passage is that those nine jewels, all those are part of the 12 that Aaron, the first high priest, wore on his breastplate when he was being anointed and consecrated to serve in the tabernacle. So again, we see this is referring to Satan serving in a priestly role in the Garden of Eden and says uh, be before he fell into sin. So I got some sound interference there. I'm not sure where that came from, but this is live. And so, um, <clears throat> so, so yes. So as I was saying, so it's, it's referring to him in his in his righteous state before he fell. And continuing, we see that this is the case throughout throughout the, as the passage continues. It speaks to him to iniquity being discovered in the devil. So we see it here. It says that from the day that thou was created, thou was with the cherub. And this is coming from the Septuagint version. I have set thee on the holy mount of God. Thou was in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was faultless in thy days from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. So again, it's speaking to the fact that the devil was perfect, faultless in his days. He was upon the holy mount of God until iniquity was found in him. So again, it's going, it's going back to the fact that the devil was on earth in Eden, serving in a priestly capacity until iniquity was found in him. So again, we see the devil in the Garden of Eden before the creation of Adam and Eve. And of course, we know in Genesis 3, at the temptation of Adam and Eve, there was uh, the, the devil is already evil at the time he appears in the garden. He's already evil. So when did that take place? So all these things are pointing us to the fact that there was a history of the rebellion of the devil took place before uh, the creation of Adam and Eve. So... But there's more evidence and we're going to get to I'm just going to take a quick break because we're having some technical issues and just get that squared away. So in the meantime, I'll do what I did last week. I gave a special preview of the trailer for the final net for the judgment of the Nephilim documentary. So I'm going, to, I'm going to put that on for a minute, take care of all the audio issues and we'll be right back. When we look at Genesis 6 from the supernatural perspective, it starts to answer a number of questions we see all throughout the Bible. Why would a loving God send a devastating flood that wiped out the entire global population, only leaving eight people alive? Why did the Pharaoh during the Exodus order all the male children in Israel to be executed? Okay, so hopefully we got that squared away. I don't know um, what was going on there, but continuing. Let's continue in the evidence for 
this history in this gap between Genesis chapter one and chapter two. So we're gonna go back again and look at this passage. And I, want, I highlighted different aspects of it this time. So if you notice here, I focus on the darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of the God moved upon the waters. And notice that it says, you know, again, this is on the first creation day. It says that God said, let there be light and there was light. And God saw the light and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So we already have this issue. That there's, there's this darkness enveloping the earth. And of course, God's divine light is what brings light and illumination and life essentially to the creation week. But I think there's another significance here. And that is that in that darkness is often equated with judgment by God. So I think what we're seeing here is a, is a judged earth. And then we have this, again, it's enveloped in water and there's darkness on the face of the deep. And so I want to just point out a couple of examples we can see here of how darkness relates to God's judgment, supernatural judgment of God. So let's take a look at that now. So here we see in Exodus chapter 10, this, of course, is Moses bringing the plagues, supernatural plagues upon God. I'm sorry, from God upon the Egyptians. And it says, God said, stretch out thy, thy hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. So this was obviously one of the plagues. Joel chapter 2 speaks of the day of the Lord. This is an end times prophecy. And he's saying, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess. Out, thick dark. We read. Well, not the day of the Lord again. End times context here. The day of the Lord is the, 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 the biblical term for the final years before the second advent of Christ. The great tribulation, the day of the Lord are interchangeable terms. And it says, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. So again, we're seeing these examples where God is his, the judgment of God is equated with darkness. And to no surprise, what do we see also? We see the earth covered with water. All we have to do is go five more chapters after Genesis 1. And what, how do we see the earth being judged by God with a flood, being flooded entirely with water? And in fact, in, fact, in judgment of the Nephilim, I, I explain how the account of Noah and coming out of the ark after the flood ends is a repetition of Genesis 1. There are so many parallels that we see between both accounts. And so let's dig again into the text to find some of these, I think, just amazing parallels. So we see here that in Genesis 8, verse 9, this is Noah, of course, testing the waters to see if it was safe to come out of the ark. It says, also, he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were, upon, were on the face of the whole earth. Remember, it says, dark, the waters were upon the earth in Genesis 1, and what what, what was hovering over the waters? The Spirit of God. That's what happened right before God said, let there be light. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the waters. Right before Noah came off the ark, he sent a dove. We were told in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit took the form of a dove at the Jordan River at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, you see these parallels. When Noah came off of the ark, uh, he entered into a new world, a new regenerated planet. Uh, he had animals with him after his own kind. Adam had animals after his own kind that he named. So again, there are many, many parallels we see between these two accounts that speak to, I think, both events taking place out of a judged world. And the second verse I listed there is from Isaiah chapter 45. And notice what it says here. It says, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. Tohu vabohu. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. 
So this is going directly back to Genesis 1-1 and saying God did not create. When he created the world, he did not create it, tohu vabohu, but he formed it to be inhabited. So again, it's speaking of the fact that the earth wasn't originally in this destroyed, desolate, water-covered darkness over the face of the deep form we find it in. In Genesis 1, verse 2, it became that way. And when you look to even to the Hebrew of uh, the word for the earth was without form and void, hayah, that term, um, the translation of it is to become. And in fact, even in the next chapter of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2, when it says that Adam became a living soul, became, that's the same verb, hayah. Um, and most of the uses of the word was in Genesis 1 are actually added um, by the translators and weren't in the original translation because in Hebrew, there really isn't a was in the way we use it in English for a past tense of to be. Um, so many reasons for that. So I just wanted to share, to share another perspective that shows scriptures, again, demonstrating that God, that was not God's intention. That's not how the earth was created. But also let's dig into what scholars of the past thought. If you're not familiar with my work, I love to research ancient theologians, first century uh, church fathers, theologians, Jewish rabbinical sources, really to go back to see what the original church thought all the way to the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, back when the supernatural aspects of the Bible were commonplace, commonly understood, totally accepted, and the church was very comfortable with these types of concepts. So let's take a look at some writings from past theologians on this exact issue. So this is from Reverend James Wolf Wolford writing in 1864. And he said, we know nothing of the boundless series of ages which elapsed between the infinitely distant beginning when God created the material universe, the heavens and the earth, or how it came to pass that God's world was lying formless and void because nothing is explicitly and categorically revealed but there are many hints and allusions scattered up and down the Old Testament, which lead to the supposition that the fall of the rebel angels under Satan may have not been unconnected with the state of darkness, ruin, and chaos. And that's from The Spirit Moving on the Waters by Reverend James Wilford. So he's connecting the fall of Satan, the rebellion of Satan, taking place in that intermediate gap, um, intervening gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Here we go to gleanings in Genesis from Arthur Pink, one of my favorite authors on Bible prophecy and questions like these. And he wrote in gleanings in Genesis, some fearful catastrophe must have occurred. Sin had dared to raise its hard head against God. And with sin came death and all its attendant evils. The fair handiwork of the creator was blasted. That which was first, uh, that which was first was so fair was now marred, and what was very good became very evil. The light was quenched, and the earth was submerged beneath the waters of judgment. And again, that's from Gleanings in Genesis in 1922. And that's just some of the evidence out there. There was a lot of writings on there, and there are even more examples from scripture um, that demonstrate it, but obviously I, there, we have other questions to get to, So, but I wanted to really make the case biblically to show that just by virtue of what the Bible states, clearly the fall of the angels, of the devil and his angels, took place before the creation of Adam and Eve. The angels had to. So there we know for a fact there is some intervening, um, there's intervening history in the Bible that took place before Adam and Eve. And even think of the concept of hell itself, the lake of fire. God said that that, that was prepared for the devil and his angels. When, would, when was that created? Again, I think all that predates Adam and Eve because the devil was already evil by the time we first see him in scripture. So that is my answer to question number one, and we will get ready to move to question number two. I'll take a quick look in the chat. I'm sure there's lots of good discussion. This is very controversial. And again, I think that it's, in, it's, I think it's a great debate. You know, I don't think the Bible states the age of the earth at all. I don't think, I think the Bible states the age of humanity, but not the earth itself. So I definitely don't, get dog, dogmatic to assign a number to the age of the earth at all because it's not in the Bible. But I think it's a good discussion. And I think that um, the more we dig into it, I think that especially when you look at it from the angelic perspective, I think it can just teach people more about what's really taking place in this earth, which is the battle 
between the forces of good and evil in the heavenly realm to try and rule over all of us. And so anything that can get us our eyes on the heavenly and the eternal perspective, even better. So let's take a quick look in here. Yep, lot, lots of good comments. Welcome everyone who's in here. I hope you guys are having great fellowship. I'll take a look at some questions also. If you have questions, I will try to um, answer some in overtime as well, if time permits. So keep it up and let's get to question number two, which is directly connected to this. So this is flowing right with the first question. And also, by the way, I've been asked the, the first question so many times, that's why I didn't even post it or assign a name to it because I've been asked it many, many times. So hopefully that answer suffices. And let's get to question two, which is connected to question one. Okay, <clears throat> does Genesis 2 describe a creation of a human race aside from Adam and Eve? Was there a pre-Adamite race? And that's from back pressure, one, two, three. So similarly with the gap theory, there's also a theory that there was another human race created, um, also sometimes called a pre-Adamite race, but pre-Adamite can mean many things. So it can mean, uh, some people use it to refer to humans, some people use it to refer to uh, like the primates or Neanderthal man or other beings, but this is talking about a human, a creation of humanity aside from, from Adam and Eve. And so, this is another theory I've heard. I'm very familiar with it and I've been asked about it many times. So I'm glad I could get to it because it's really kind of connected to the gap theory because it's talking kind of about the early stages of creation. So let's look at what I think is the most common um, basis of this theory. And also just to, just to get make it clear on my answer, my answer to this question is no. I do not believe that there was a second humanity or a human race that preceded Adam and Eve in Genesis. I do not believe that at all. I think that the inhabitants of the earth before Adam and Eve were the angels and particularly, specifically, clearly Satan and his rebel faction. Obviously, I think that's that's laid out in scripture. But let's look at what the basis of this idea is. So here we see the two accounts uh, of the creation of man. So we have Genesis 1, 26 to 27, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And then in Genesis chapter 2, we see where Adam is specifically named. And it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became, Haya, by the way, a living soul. Genesis 2, verse 7. So what the uh, pre-Adamite theory says is that these two passages are describing two different races. That there was an initial humanity created in Genesis 1, on the sixth day, and then later on, Adam, who we commonly know, Adam as, as an Adam and Eve, was created after the creation week um, at a subsequent period. And so I don't think there's biblical support for this um, for several reasons. And the first is, you might notice, I put in the Hebrew, in Genesis 1, it says, God said, let us make man, which is Adam, Adam in our image. So right there, the scripture is telling you this, this is Adam. His, the, the Hebrew word is Adam. It's his name. Um, so it's telling you right there in a literal sense that they are, that they are creating Adam. So, and of course it says male and female created he them. We find out later in Genesis that before Eve sinned, she and Adam were both called Adam. So, right. So they were one flesh reflecting God's true plan for uh, marriage. So right there alone, that tells you that that is Adam. He's created. But I think we even find doctrinally that the idea of Adam being the first man created is actually a very important fact from a doctrinal standpoint when it comes to the gospel and when it comes to our redemption. And so now we'll look at some New Testament passages that shed some light on why that's so important.
Oh, actually, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go someplace else. So actually, before we get to the New Testament, I'm going to look at one other passage here. And so what we see here in Genesis 2 is this is the full explanation, the full description of the creation of Adam. And what Genesis 2, I believe, is doing is serving as a parenthetical chapter to chapter one. It's giving greater detail of what we see in chapter one. This is done several times in Genesis and is done also in the book of Revelation. And so here we see in verse 18, it says, the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And notice it says, and the Lord out of the ground formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. So this is indicating to us that chapter two is going back to the creation week, going back to the time that God formed the animals. So this is, I think, is a big scriptural clue that we're reading a parenthetical passage. Of course, Adam names the animals, and then we see the creation of Eve. So this completely aligns with Genesis 1, making man, and then saying, in his image made he them, male and female made he them. The animals were created first, Adam was created after the animals, and then Eve was then created after Adam. So again, I think that little line there that when that when adam named the animals they were just created by god is showing us that we're going back to the creation week but just going into greater detail it's so i call these parenthetical chapters so they're just they're just zooming in on the details that were just mentioned in one verse in the in the preceding chapter okay so moving on Let's go now to, when we think about, okay, so another thing I want to talk about too is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when it talks about the fact that death came by one man and sin, through and sin, this concept of being, being basically of sinful humanity. And I explained this in Judgment of the Nephilim, how the contrast between Adam and Jesus, Adam, Jesus is known as the last Adam. So the first Adam, because of sin and the fact that we inherit the sin nature, this is a very important concept when it comes to salvation. The Bible teaches that because Adam sinned, death and sin pass on to all people. So we literally inherit the sin nature of Adam. This is why all people our sinners are born. David said that in Psalm 51 that he was shaping in iniquity in the womb. So this is an important concept because it explains how God, uh, kind of how spiritual genetics works in humanity. And this is why it is so important that Jesus was the seed of the woman because it's passed down, explaining judgment of the Nephilim, that the sin nature is passed down from the father to his offspring. This is why even though Eve sinned first, in Adam all dies, but the, was what the Bible teaches, that it's through Adam that sin is passed on, not through Eve. And so Eve, uh, as the woman, she received the prophecy, right? She received the ultimate prophecy. We we're told that the Messiah would come from a woman, be the seed of the woman. And of course, Jesus, in his advent, in his incarnation, has God the Father as his father. So that's why he's the only begotten son, because this, this idea of begetting is, is, the, is the biblical term for the spiritual inheritance we receive from our, our ultimate parents, from Adam, from Adam. And so this is why Jesus Christ is the last Adam, because he's able to restart the new creation, the, the glorified, sinless, redeemed believers. So that's why in Christ, we have eternal life. In Adam, all die. In Christ, we live. And so that's why our redemption I even explained this last week that it's it's both spiritual and physical. We receive a newborn spirit, born of God, but also a new body made like Christ's body. So we all the inheritance of the sinful nature is gone in Christ. So, so it's almost like Jesus is undoing all of the bad spiritual inheritance the first Adam left for all of human history. So very, very important concept to understand because it's really it really shows how important it, Adam is as a type of the work of Christ, which is why, again, Jesus is called the last Adam. So now let's look at one other uh, piece of evidence here. 
here we see here again going now going to the scriptures again in first corinthians 15 the first adam was made a living soul but the last adam made a quickening spirit death came for since by man came death so again it's contrasting adam all die in christ we live romans chapter 5 wherefore as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin so again it's talking about the idea of the first sin came from one man who was it Adam. Again, it continues saying, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over that them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So again, it's explaining that Adam is the start of humanity. And then finally, in Luke 3.38, we get this reverse genealogy of Jesus going backwards, starting from Jesus, going backwards to the beginning of humanity. When we get to the end of the chronology, it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So again, the Bible is showing us that the gene, that Adam is the beginning of humanity. And of course, there's also the question of if there was this separate human race, why aren't they mentioned? Why is their genealogy never mentioned? Why aren't they ever named? What did they do? What role do they play? It's never, ever, ever discussed. And so I think that that's really how the Bible establishes it. Additionally, you know, some people, it also, some people use this theory to answer the question of, well, where did Cain get a wife from? How did Cain start a city? Who was he worried about killing him? Something we addressed in a previous Thursday Night Theology about specifically about Cain, where I explained that again, in Genesis chapters four and five, we get a parenthetical passage that explains that Adam for centuries had sons and daughters. He lived to be 930. So there's a lot of people on the earth for Cain to marry, which again would be one of his relatives. And so this is in a previous episode. So again, I think the Bible can explain these things when we look, um, examine it closely. And I'll just close out this looking at one quote this is from a book called Terra Firma, looking at this exact question by David Scott. And he wrote, there is no discrepancy in the account in the account of creation of man as recorded in Genesis 1, 26 to 32 and 2, 7 to 25, the two passages in question. The first briefly states that he was created in the image and likeness of God. And the second gives the details of his formation. It was doubtless considered unnecessary to repeat in the second chapter but it had already been mentioned a few weeks before in the first. I'm sorry, a few verses before in the first. But to give a circumstantial account of the formation of Adam and his wife Eve, which is what we get in chapter two. But the man of the second chapter is identical with that of the first, is proved a little further where it is written, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And of course, again, to 1901, from David Wardlow Scott, and he's quoting, again, later on in the book of Genesis, we're told that this is the book of the generations of Adam. Adam is the beginning of human creation. So that is my answer on question number two. And we're going to keep it moving. And I'll do again, uh, as I did last week, I'm going to debut one more time. <laughs> Since we had some technical issues last week, um, the trailer for the study guide. So you saw the documentary. If you're not familiar with my books, there's a documentary there. Those documents, I put the documentary trailer already. There's a documentary for Judgment of the, Nephil of the Nephilim, which called Secrets of the Pre-Flood World, as well as the final Nephilim, Battle for Heaven and Earth. And these are high-level overviews of my work, of my research. And basically, you can, learn, you can learn the whole book in a night. And so that's what it's made for. But if you want to get deeper into the study and really understand the sources, the etymology in Greek and Hebrew, all the ancient scholars and scholars through the centuries that I quote and be able to really speak or study in a group setting at a church or at home just for your own personal study. We also have the companion study guides for both books, and you will see the trailer for that right now.
Okay, so there it is. And I'll also just pop up because I've been asked this many times, if you want to know what does the study guide actually look like? What do the pages look like? The questions are all done by me. Here are a couple of sample pages and there's commentary all throughout it. There's many questions. I wrote all the questions. And again, it's about getting deeper into the text, understanding the verses. And uh, there's times there's spaces for, for prayer, for reflection, for devotion, all that type of good stuff to help you build up your knowledge of the word of God. So now let's get moving to question number three. Who is the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 to 8? And this is from Karen. Excellent question. And so this is a really, uh, the, the theories on this question are all over the map. So, um, but I have my own, which I'm going to share right now, on who I believe the restrainer or what the restrainer is that's described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So first things first, let's go, of course, to the text to understand what is this about? What is, where, what is this question even talking about? So let's take a look at this passage. So this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I actually put in some verses from the beginning to give the context. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to the church and says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, we're talking about end time prophecy, the second advent. And by our gathering together unto him, that you be not shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as, the, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So this, the history behind this, this epistle is that they had received a letter that was falsely written under the name of the Apostle Paul that basically told them they were living in the Great Tribulation that had started. And so now he's reassuring them that it had not started yet. And he said, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and then that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, of course, referring to the Antichrist. And now we get to the principal passage. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Again, clearly referring to the Antichrist who will be destroyed, that wicked. So it's saying, Paul is saying that there is something that will be moved out of the way. And that will usher in the, the revelation, the full revelation of the Antichrist says that wicked shall be revealed. And so. What or who is this, right? So, because Paul actually says he shall be removed. So, who is this that's going to be removed? And so, my answer to this question is to what is holding what you know. And, and again, this is again talking about the end times, the the great tribulation, the day of the Lord, the context. So, again, at the time of the great tribulation, this is all speaking in the future context. There is going to be something restraining the full revelation of the Antichrist, and what I. Who I believe this is, um, is the Archangel Michael. And I'll explain why. Um, and I think there's scriptural evidence that demonstrates why Michael plays a pivotal role in the revelation of the Antichrist, right? It says that wicked shall be revealed. There are two re revelations that take place. First, the Antichrist, and then the full revelation of Jesus Christ as second advent. His revelation to Israel, his revelation to the world, that he is God. And so... <clears throat> How could this be? How could that be the case? We're going to look at why uh, and what role Michael plays in the end times. And so let's, of course, go to Scripture. So here, I think, are two things that establish um, why I think this is the case. So we're going to look at Daniel chapter 10. And of course, I actually discussed this last week. This ties in. It's amazing how God lines up these episodes of Thursday Night Theology. In last week's episode, we talked about... Uh, the different angels assigned over territories and nations. And here we see, again, Daniel chapter 10, this is the angel coming to visit Daniel and says that the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this fallen angelic prince, fought the angel, for the righteous angel, for 21 days. And of course, this is Gabriel speaking to Daniel, and he said, below, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remain there with the kings of Persia. So he's speaking about this conflict that he was in. Daniel had prayed on behalf of Israel to be released from the Babylonian captivity for 21 days. He prayed and fasted. And 
the angel was coming to deliver the message and prophecy to him. But the prince of Persia, this fallen angelic being who was had authority over Persia, a principality, fought with the fought with Gabriel for 21 days until Michael intervened and helped fight him. And then he continues. I, I skipped to the end of that chapter because because then Gabriel says, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth Hazak in Hebrew with me in these things. But Michael, your prince. So see this idea of Michael is standing and holding, basically uh, holding um, like almost like holding down the fort with Gabriel. He says that Michael is the one who does it. Your prince. Again, this is speaking to Daniel as an Israelite. So there's a connection between Michael being the protector of Israel. Then we get to Daniel chapter 11. And I think this passage is really important because Daniel 12, I think, is what makes the is what establishes when Michael shall when this all takes place, this revealing and the restrainer being removed, I think it's in Daniel 12, 1. But the important thing to understand about Daniel 12, 1 is that it's a continuation of Daniel chapter 11. This is very important to understand. When the Bible is first written, the chapter breaks that we have were not in the original version of the Bible. So Daniel 12, 1 is a direct continuation from Daniel chapter 11. So that's why when we look at this passage, I start in the end of chapter 11. So let's look at that. And it says, and he, and this is a prophecy, Daniel chapter 11 ends with a prophecy of Antichrist. It's chronicling his career, actually. And it says, and he, Antichrist, shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. This, of course, is speaking of Israel, of Jerusalem, which is in the glorious holy mountain between the two seas, the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. Yet he shall come to an end and none shall help him. So it's saying that the Antichrist is going to die at the time he plants his tabernacle on the Holy Mountain. In the final Nephilim, I go about this. This is describing this receives his. We get to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince with prince which standeth for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to the same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered everyone that shall be found written in the book so this is clearly talking about the end times the antichrist meets his end and then at that time michael stands up and then there's trouble so clearly the implication here is that this end that Antichrist meets is not the end of the Antichrist because it's right. It says that at that time, Michael stands and there's trouble such as there's never been. And of course, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ quotes this in Matthew 24, speaking of the great tribulation, says there'll be tribulation such as never was on this earth. So again, it's connecting this. And so what is this, is this standing that Michael does? So that word stand, a modern Hebrew has many different meanings. It can mean to move aside. It can mean to stand. It can mean to hold. And so I think it's referring to Michael standing, moving up. And where is he going? I believe he he's leaving earth to go to heaven. And why is he doing that? It's because in the midpoint of the seven years, at the time where the Antichrist is going to be fully indwelled by the spirit of Apollyon, of Abaddon, and become the Antichrist of Revelation 13, that is preceded by the devil being cast from earth. And so we find this, of course, in Revelation chapter 12. Oh, sorry. Okay, we looked at that. Okay, let's go to... Okay, here we are. <laughs> and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, right? You see this woman, this vision, this is Revelation 12. Clothed with the sun, the, under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. This is symbolic of Israel. This is, matches the vision that Joseph had in Genesis 37 when he had the dream of his family. It was a woman with 12 stars in her, over her head. And it says, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. So this is when Israel is forced to flee into the wilderness 
at the midpoint of the day of the Lord, the great tribulation, where they're going to be supernaturally protected by God in the wilderness for 1,260 days or three and a half years. This is all a repetition of the Exodus when, the, when Israel was protected, brought into the wilderness and protected by God to, to escape from Pharaoh. Also the Antichrist is all a repetition of the Exodus. I, and I go into great t detail about this in the final Nephilim, but then we get to the war. And the end, there was what's continuing, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, what is this saying? That at that point, Revelation 12 and Daniel 12. Those are parallel passages that Daniel standing up is when he is going to heaven to fight this war. And as he does this, the devil is evicted permanently from heaven. He can no longer access heaven. And now he's forced to forced to earth. And Revelation 12 continues and says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because the devil has come upon you uh, with great wrath, for he knoweth he hath but a short time. The devil knows his time is short. And this is when we see, this is what leads into Revelation 13, where you see the seven-headed beast, that is the Antichrist, emerge from the sea. This is when the devil now fully empowers, satanically empowers the Antichrist, and he now reveals his true nature. He comes into power as a deceiver, pretending to be the Messiah of the world. That's, that's going to be his ascent. But then he's, once he suffers his deadly wound, which we see described in the end of Daniel 11, he then is, he, it says he suffers a mortal wound and is healed. He basically mimics and fakes the resurrection of the Messiah. That's when he wins the world over, and that's when he no longer has any pretense. He's no longer pretending to be a messianic figure. He's no longer pretending to be righteous or holy. He declares himself God. He goes into the temple and proclaims himself God. He commits the abomination of desolation. He sets up the image of the beast, the mark of the beast. All these things happen, but the pivotal thing that triggers it is Satan being cast out of heaven. That is when he comes down, he opens the abyss, the spirit of Abaddon, of Apollyon, the spirit that will indwell the Antichrist is then released. And that's when he comes into his full power. And so what has changed is that Michael has to leave. And of course, where does he go? To Israel. This is when Antichrist is trying to take over Israel. He goes into the temple in Israel and proclaims himself God. He sets up the abomination. The image of the beast is set up in the temple to be worshipped, demanding worship. So this is why I believe, this is why I believe the restrainer, what was holding that, preventing that from happening was Michael being able to defend. And we see in the war in heaven, he beats the devil. So Michael is, is and his angels, his army are mightier than the devil's army. So once he kicks them out of heaven, now, they're, now they can go down to earth and they can obviously lay their eyes on taking over Israel and the temple and setting up his false Messiah in the temple. So this is why I go with the restrainer being the Archangel Michael. And again, I know there's lots of different answers and theories out there, but I think that that is the clear kind of biblical evidence that what really is moved out of the way is that Michael goes to heaven. And now Israel does not have its, its angelic protector there. And the Antichrist goes right into the temple at that point, is revived from, from his mortal wound, goes into the temple and proclaims himself to be God of all. And of course, that leads to everything we see in Revelation 13. So, that is my answer on question number three. So uh, now I'll take a quick look into the chat, see if I have time for one or two questions. See, there's a lot of discussion here, a lot of comments here. So let me see here. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Looking for questions. Someone said Jesus is the is Michael the archangel. No, I definitely do not believe that's the case <laughs> at all. <laughs> the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. 
Hey, that's a, that's, that's a good one. Okay, so Holland said the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. Good point. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely address that one because I think that's a really, really good. I, that makes sense, right? That the Holy Spirit would be holding back wickedness. But here's why I think that uh, <clears throat> I, I don't agree with that for several reasons. And the first is that there's, there are many prophecies of the Holy Spirit uh, having a presence in the end times, right? In Isaiah, uh, in chapter 59, it says that when the enemy comes upon us like a flood, it's an end times context. Definitely the whole second half of that chapter is end times. It says the spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. So it's saying the Holy Spirit is going to step in when the enemy, the Antichrist, comes in like a flood, when the devil is on earth, right? When the devil comes to earth, it says that he casts out a flood at the woman, right? The woman was in travail, Israel in Revelation 12. It says he, 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 a flood comes from his mouth to try and destroy her. Um, but of course, she escapes to the wilderness. So again, I think that passage is saying the spirit of the Lord is going to be active in the Great Tribulation. We see the, uh, the 144,000 uh, Jewish witnesses in Revelation 7. They're sealed with the sign of God to go out and preach. The two witnesses, you know, I believe there's the Holy Spirit, all this is taking place, their power that they have, they can call fire from heaven. Anyone who tries to, who tries to harm them is, is destroyed. Um, I believe that's all the Holy Spirit at work. And of course, Zechariah 12, God tells us specifically that in the end times, he's going to pour out his spirit of grace and supplication. The Holy Spirit is going to have a revival in, in the world among those who are all the uh, as they call them, tribulation believers, you know, whether they're Christians or the remnant, the believing remnant of Israel, like they're going to be protected in the wilderness. They're going to be taught by God. I believe all this is going to be the Holy Spirit at work when it says that Israel shall look upon Jesus, uh, the one who, whom, whom they pierced as a loss, as a son whom they lost. Right. This idea of this incredible repentance and remorse in the believing remnant of Israel that can only come and the mourning that will take place. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. So I don't believe the Holy Spirit is ever going to be removed from the earth um, at any time, but not even in, in the end times as well. Because there's so much, I think, powerful prophecies that have to be the Holy Spirit working. So a very good point. I mean, I think that's a very valid theory. It's a very tough question. It's a very challenging question. So, I, yeah, so I'm glad that uh, someone brought that up. Okay, I'll look for one more if I can find it. Find another question here. Okay, I see someone said the Garden of Eden was a different realm. I, I do believe that, right? It was an intersection of the heavenly realm and the earthly realm was where God could also manifest. So I do believe that, um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. All right, I think we're gonna wrap it up there. And I'm, I'm not gonna forget to um, pick our winner. You receive again, a copy, an autographed copy of the final Nephilim. And I will send it to you anywhere you are in the world, free of charge. And our winner, Today is Amador Valentin. Amador. Apologies if I did not pronounce your name correctly, but at least Amador Valentin. Uh, so all you have to do is contact me, DM me either through any of my social media. You can contact me on my website as well, and you will receive a free copy. Just send me your shipping information, and you will receive a free uh, autographed copy of the final Nephilim. All right, and so let me get my banners going. So hope you enjoyed um, our Thursday Night Theology tonight. Again, um, if you're watching this on replay and you have questions for the future, leave them in the comment section. I'll be glad to answer them. If you are interested in learning more about Judgment of the Nephilim, the final Nephilim, the documentaries, the DVDs, you can find it all at judgmentofthenephilim.com here. You can see here the description of the final Nephilim, which is now available. Uh, it again, it gets into 
all of the end times, it goes from Genesis to Revelation, exploring how the prophecies of Revelation will unfold. It examines the Antichrist, the return of the sons of God of Genesis 6. It gets into quantum physics. It gets into the UFO alien phenomenon, all those things and much, much more. And most importantly, highlights the specific return, the second advent of Christ. There's so many details to what we call Armageddon. It's not just one battle. It's a series of battles. And the way that Christ comes back, it's beautiful. It's amazing. And it's all been declared from the beginning of scripture. And you can find that all in the final Nephilim. For more information, you see it there. All my links to my social media is in the description of this video. Uh, like, subscribe, feel free to reach out to me with questions and share God's word. Spread these, spread these teachings, spread these sessions so people can learn together. That's what we're here to do, to learn and grow in our knowledge of Christ the Savior and share his gospel. The good news, spoiler alert, at the end of Revelation, Jesus wins. He is victorious over the devil, the Antichrist, over all the forces of evil and will give the eternal kingdom to all who believe. So share that message. Hope you had a great time. Thank you for watching. And Lord willing, I will see you on the next Thursday Night Theology.